Alright, so continuing onwards with uh, chapter 16, um, we want to have a story on why nominal exchange rates can also depend on the deviation of the real exchange rate in addition to um, the PPP deviation, if you like. So, in other words, we need to have a little bit of a discussion of um, on w what is driving the real exchange rate. We generally identify two sources, and the first one is a relative demand for, when we say US, we actually mean domestic, whatever the home country is, uh, domestic products. So, if uh, other countries start demanding more products, uh, more New Zealand products, more US, more, more domestic products, um, this results in an increase in the price of the domestic products simply because there is more demand for them. So this is, you can think about this as kind of an expenditure switching effect uh, for the domestic products. Um, and that will of course appreciate the uh, real exchange rate at home um, yeah so s in, in the home country so it could also work the opposite way so for some reason the, the expenditures could switch or shift or the demand could shift away from New Zealand products and into um, foreign products in which case um, the prices in of New Zealand stuff uh, would uh, reduce compared to uh, the foreign price but in the case of increase in the relative demand, there is a real appreciation. And it's a real appreciation for, for, for reasons of the real exchange rate moving, basically. Alternatively, we can think about the relative supply. This was the demand of, of the world, if you like, for, for the home stuff. And this is the relative supply of the home stuff. So it could be that there is increase in productivity or any other reason that uh, there is or a particularly good season uh, in, in terms of the uh, yields, of the crop yields, or... Um, and so on. So, uh, an increase in the domestic supply of the product can happen for uh, for real, as opposed to nominal reasons. For whatever that reason or source of the the increase in the supply is, it results into um, in, a, in a decrease in the domestic price relative to the rest of the world. So, the home price, in this case the U.S. the P.U.S. is going to drop relative to everything else uh, the, relative to the current. US dollar denominated foreign price, which is here, the European price, and vice versa. So, in the case of a decrease of relative supply, uh, the home of the home country, obviously, uh, there would be an appreciation in case of the increase, as it is here, there would be a real depreciation. So, this b basically brings us to the, to the two lines. And the first one is the relative supply curve. The relative supply curve does not depend on the real exchange rate, it's just that sort of technology side of the of the country or um, it could be the amount of capital that suddenly increases or it could be a good season something that has nothing to do with the real exchange rate and if there's an increase of the relative supply as we just described um, there will be a depreciation so the intercept is going to shift to the right and up and consequently we will have two effects one is more output uh, domestically, and the other one is a, a depreciated real exchange rate. So the rel rel relative real supply is a vertical line. The real demand or relative demand is a uh, is an upward sloping line, and the reason why it's an upward sloping line is what we just described here. So if there is an increase in the relative demand for for products in made in the U.S., there's going to be a, a, a relative a depreciation of the real, real exchange rate. So. Um, so it's an upward solving relationship, basically. Um, okay, so there are both monetary and fiscal, sorry, and, and uh, real factors that influence nominal exchange rates now. So that goes back to this aspect that I just explained initially. Um, the exchange rate can be thought of as a product of the real exchange rate and a ratio of prices. The ratio of prices is driven primarily by monetary factors, but the real aspect, the real exchange rate, is driven by the factors that I've just described. So the relative demand for our stuff, and if there's suddenly more d being demanded, that uh, that results in an increase of prices, ceteris paribus. So for a given supply, if there's an exogenous increase of demand, uh, in other words, a shift to the right of the RD line, the intercept drops, so that is an appreciation of the real exchange rate. Or it could be this um, productivity increasing or decreasing, which is shifting the RS line. Right? So those are real aspects of the economy changing, um, and as a result of that, we could have an appreciation or depreciation of real exchange rate and that is one component of this more general theory of exchange rate determination in the long run. Right, so it's nominal factors shifting this side, real factor shifting that side. Um, of course, if there's a real factor shifting, 
prices may also be shifting as a result, but certainly if nominal factors are shifting then or changing, then there is nothing happening with the real exchange rate, it's just the nominal exchange rate moving. Sorry, it's just the price levels that are moving. But real factors can influence both of these, and this is the this is the possibility. So again, just to confirm that we understand uh, this, this basically Q at the real exchange rate, which we've defined on the slide before, a few slides before, well, I don't know where it was defined, here, um, is basically a construct that measures a deviation from PVP. So, so this approach to nominal exchange rate in the long run is a little bit more general than what we've discussed so far, in which we assume PVP holds all the time. Here, PVP doesn't need to hold because this real exchange rate can deviate from one, which is the PVP parity. All right. And we describe why it may deviate from one. Right? So these two results, or these two reasons, basically relative demand, relative supply. Okay, both monetary and real factors can influence real exchange rates. As a result, uh, anything that influences the real exchange rate uh, will il also influence the nominal exchange rate. And monetary factors directly influence prices, which uh, of course compose or are an important component of the real exchange rate. So when only monetary factors change and PPP hold. We have exactly the same predictions as before, and when we have factors influencing real output that are changing, uh, so something that moves the real exchange rate, we will have a, a departure from the PPP uh, and also a movement in the nominal exchange rate. Okay, so here, and, and I earlier mentioned that, mm, where was it? Here. Here I was also mentioning, I think that, uh, well, or here, I just mentioned that when real factors change, not only is the real exchange rate going to move, but prices may move as well. And it's pretty obvious. It comes from the money market equilibrium. So that's what the next slide is telling us. So just rem recall that uh, price level in, at home at, or also in the foreign country has to be um, result or is determined in an equilibrium on the money market where the price uh, money supply equals money demand or real money supply equals real money demand and in the long run we know that prices are determined um, from that equation so if output changes or something on the real side of the economy changes then the demand for real money balances changes and therefore prices change so not only is the real exchange rate going to be changing which was the hypothetical scenario I was just going through here so the real exchange rate out output shifts to the right for an increased productivity reason. The real exchange rate is going to depreciate, so that's the one part. This is going to go up, but also price uh, at home is going to change, right? So that's oops, sorry, that's this part here. So price um, at home is going to go down if output goes up because when output goes up, um, we demand more cash. Basically, we want to make more transactions. We're richer. And that's in the denominator. Th remember, this is under a hypothetical scenario when there is nothing happening with the money supply. In real world, of course, uh, you know when output goes up, usually the central bank is pumping more, c more cash as well, so money supply would be moving. But here, you know, we are doing a hypothetical scenario. So uh, output goes up, P has to go down, and uh, therefore we have two effects. One is the real appreciation of the currency, so the real exchange rate. Sorry, real. Um, yeah, real depreciation of the currency, and the other one is a price level increase at the same time. So, what is the total outcome? Uh, it's not clear. It really depends on the sign of, sorry, the size of these two changes. Okay. So this is just a summary. So, if um, when economic conditions are only influenced by the monetary factors. Um, and the assumption of PPP hold, then nominal exchange rates are determined by the PPP. But when there are cause factors other than monetary, so factors that real factors that affect real output, then exchange rates are also determined by uh, real exchange rate. Right. So that's a new aspect. Not just the PPP concept, which is this price level, you know, gap, but also the real exchange rate. All right. So the finish is kind of very easy here. Uh, you know, the interest rate equation, which was interest rate parity, can now be rewritten a little bit more generally. So instead of the Fisher equation, which was before, which basically didn't have this part there, um, now we can rewrite the real exchange rate as a combination of these two parts. So real exchange rate, sorry, nominal, can be a deviation from real exchange rate and a deviation or difference in prices. If we write it out as we do here, um, in percentage changes, then we have a percentage change in uh, in the real exchange rate. So that's a real exchange rate depreciation, and inflation or percentage change in prices, which is an inflation differential. 
So the difference in nominal interest rates across the two countries is now the sum of not just the inflation differential, but also the differential of real exchange rate, um, in other words, uh, an expected real exchange rate depreciation. Right? So, um, and then we can identify different kinds of uh, uh, sources and movements in the long run of uh, monetary policy and um, real, a real economy influencing um, a real long run, sorry, nominal, a uh, long run uh, exchange rate. So if there is an increase in the money supply at home, <coughs> here this is the US, that simply is going to increase the price level and that's going to proportionally increase uh, nominal exchange rates. So that is a depreciation. Uh, vice versa, if it's happening in the foreign country, because it's the foreign price level which will be increasing. So it's a, a depreciation of the foreign country's um, currency or uh, an appreciation of the home currency, which is the same thing. All right. Um, in terms of growth rate changes, it's just a relationship in growth in percentage differences. So everything else stays the same except the um, the, the, the rate of growth is, is it's not the level which is moving, but the rate of growth that is that is moving. So a depreciation rate is going to increase. Um, in the case of money growth, a rate increase, and in this case, an appreciation rate is going to uh, increase rather than the, just a level of the currency. On the real market, the output market, uh, we can also think of the same thing. So, you know, increasing the demand for for the domestic output is going to appreciate uh, the, nom the the nominal exchange rate and the reason for it is that it appreciates the the real exchange rate in the first place prices do not respond so much increasing demand for european does the opposite so it's a foreign country in the case of the supply changes as opposed to demand for our stuff from the from the foreign countries this is unclear and the reason why it's unclear is exactly this slide here so it results in two effects one is the depreciation of the real exchange rate but at the same time prices at home go down which should result in an appreciation of the nominal exchange rate so there are these two offsetting effects and really we are not sure what the result is so the real exchange rate in inflation uh, you know and are inflation adjusted uh, interest rates so real interest rates are inflation adjusted interest rates mm, so literally we are just removing the expected inflation from the nominal interest rate and if you substitute that into the red equation two slides back you know this this nominal can be expressed as real plus inflation so difference in them will be real interest rates difference plus inflation difference so inflation difference is basically going to drop out if i if i rewrite this equation in real interest rate terms there will be no inflation differential that's what we are going to get right so it's on this slide here so the definition of real interest rate differential is the nominal adjusted for inflation in both countries and they are sub they're subtracted from each other and then i can rewrite the nominal from three slides back as as a difference between real exchange rate depreciation and the differential in inflation rates and finally I combine the two and I get that the real interest rate differential is equal to the real expected appreciation sorry depreciation of uh, of the real currency of the home currency and this is called real interest rate parity simply because you know it's like a nominal interest rate parity but it's in real terms and note that it relates directly to um, a real exchange rate uh, depreciation so if the country's real exchange rate is depreciating a lot we would expect its interest rates to be higher than the rest of the world and these are the real interest rates not the nominal ones right so in terms of summarizing because that's basically what we're left with LOP, PPP these concepts are things that you need to know and they will be definitely on the exam um, and then there are these two approaches one is the PPP approach or the monetary approach they are the same thing um, and these are long-term or long-run approaches and they both so the PPP approach is assuming the PPP holds we know that's not necessarily true but in differences is a, or the relative PPP um, the qu holds quite well or reasonably well so so that's something we can work with and it predicts that changing the growth rate of money supply influences inflation and consequently and the exchange rate so if money supply goes up or the growth rate of it goes up inflation will rise and as a result the exchange rate is going to depreciate okay and then uh, 
empirical support for the absolute PPP is weak, the relative PPP has better support. Um, the reasons are trade barriers and non-traded products, and importantly we describe these two theories which explain why PPP does not hold, why we have real exchange rates that are higher in the in the in the rich countries than in poor countries, and you need to know those theories for the exam. All right, so the real exchange rate approach is a little bit more general. So it allows to for the, these deviations to come not just from the monetary side, but also from the real side in the sense of productivity goes up or down, or the demand for domestic stuff goes up or down. And interest rate differences are then explained more generally as a expected change in the value of domestic products relative to foreign products, um, plus the difference in the inflation rate. So. In the real, in the real sense, it, they end up being equal to real exchange rate depreciation in expectation. All right, and that's basically what I already mentioned. This part here, real interest rate parity. Uh, you can skip this; it doesn't really matter. Hyperinflation is just for fun. Uh, you know, we have lots of episodes in which inflation rates are very high. Uh, historically speaking, we've had quite a few of those. Now it's less frequent, but we've still had Zimbabwe recently. Um, so hyperinflation is more than 50% per month as opposed to a year. So um, dub pr prices double approximately every 51 days at this rate, but of course it's not the highest rate we've seen. Mm. Right. So some people argue it's 1,000% per year, but anyway, this is kind of irrelevant. Um, yeah. Anyway, a few examples here is Zimbabwe, and Zimbabwe is really interesting because of the how recent it is. Mm. So first it was sort of a creeping inflation, so a really high level of inflation, but but not uh, dramatically so. But it went out of control pretty quickly, so it went from 50% to 580% in the span of six years. And uh, in 2007 then it creeped up, uh, crept up to 12,000%. So that's... Uh, one of the five worst inflationary periods of all time, um, according to Jeffrey Sachs. And um, at some point in 2008, people simply stopped using the currency and they started using uh, some other currencies, namely the US dollars and the South African rands. And here you have um, from 2010 a photograph of uh, 100 trillion Zimbabwean dollars. Um, and above it you have a slightly older, it could be a year older or so, which is 100 billion, so <laughs> the nomination which is a uh, thousand, um, well, one, th one one thousand of, of, the, of the new banknote. Um, yeah. So dollarization of the economy, which is what happened in Zimbabwe, isn't new. It happened before in other countries. It gives the country a bit of a breather because uh, and, and it's it's quite uh, peculiar in a sense because uh, you you basically are giving up one option of your own sovereignty, namely printing cash, because you are so bad at it that you can't even print it at a at a consistent manner. You print it too fast. You print it just to pay somebody uh, m instead of trying to find tax revenue to pay for pay, pay for services the government. So. So it, it's it's really showing you an uh, inability to uh, manage your own uh, country well when you have to give up your own currency because you are um, the country is better off without your own currency. So uh, this is called dollarization. It happened in uh, Ecuador as well. It happened in um, in um, Zimbabwe. And it's not really mentioned here explicitly, but recently Zimbabwe has. So after this was written, Zimbabwe has adopted just uh, the U.S. dollar as the official currency. Of course, then it cannot do anything about the money supply because uh, Zimbabwean central bank does not print U.S. dollars. So, uh, different ways to to deal with this. Uh, countries have tried re-denominating, um, so changing the currency from old pesos to new pesos and, and such. So just simply removing uh, uh, lots of zeros um, in the process. It's really just nominal change of sort of mindset as opposed to anything, but it has to be backed by action because if it isn't, the same hyperinflation will continue. So it's more an attempt to f to, to adjust expectations, um, but it needs to be you know supported by an actual change in in the level at which these new banknotes are being printed. And just out of curiosity, the highest ever. Um, uh, in hyperinflation was in Hungary, and we don't have the figures here, but you can look it up there. There's lots of papers on this. 
but yeah, the, the old currency was called Penga and basically became worthless and there was uh, this many of them <laughs> in circulation in, uh, right after World War II. Alright, so price level on the horizontal line, change in the local currency, so exchange rate depreciation on the vertical line, 10 to the 30. <laughs> in the case of a Hungary span of one year. Just imagine 10 to the 30. So there are 30 zeros basically. Zimbabwe only had 24 zeros at the end of its um, rate of growth um, in, in percent. Insane. Um, so as you can imagine, there are real, this is really difficult situation to be in and there are courses on this and you can go to Reserve Bank's webpage New Zealand Reserve Bank uh, webpage to, to re uh, listen to John McDermott talk about hyperinflation but as you can imagine if prices are doubling every few minutes it becomes really costly to to buy stuff and to, to transact, to make transactions and people stop using money because it's just becoming worthless and, and it's really uncertain how much you need and people were running around with wheelbarrows full of cash and just counting it is difficult so instead you resort to something else, I don't know, you use gold and so on and so forth so so that concludes this chapter 16 which is kind of a neat little chapter and it will be on the exam so do study it, I'll, I'll talk about the exam more later. Okay, bye.